Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Happy to have you here today, and I would like to welcome all our Empower Women members and friends, and to say that we are happy to be together at the third um, session of the webinar series of the Roadmap to Success. Uh, as you know, uh, especially those who already attended the first uh, two webinars from this series, this is a series of six webinars, three in English and three in Spanish, organized in collaboration with ECPAPALEC and our champion, Clarissa. And uh, we would like to just speak frankly about what is an individual roadmap to success, how we can um, have some some trips and, 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 you know, advices to follow and to be successful or maybe how to overcome some barriers and not to repeat some challenges that some of us already had. So please follow our announcements and join us today. We have the third session of, from this series and the general topic is Alternatives Way to Progress Academically. Um, uh, my name is Diana and I'm here today with you. I will be moderating and I will try to select the most interesting question and the most challenging questions for our panelists and to have a very interesting discussion all together. And um, if um, if you would like specifically to express your views, please, I will let you know in one bit how you can do that. So welcome everyone, let's start. Our agenda is very simple as usual. We will have some greetings and introduction. We will follow with the presentation number one, and then we will have, uh, follow with the presentation of a second panelist. We do have some challenges in the agenda, as you can see. Those who followed our announcements um, uh, knew that today the second panelist had to be the Jose Avila Petroche. Unfortunately, he had some medical problems and we will have to reschedule his presentation, but we promise he will come in the next webinar and he will deliver his presentation. And uh, even for we will have three panelists, we will have him as a special guest and we will be able to hear his insights. But today we have today with us Clarissa who is co-organizing with uh, us this uh, uh, webinar series and I'm sure she also has some secrets to share with you. And also we have Sally um, uh, and she is a very interesting uh, young woman very, uh, and this, we will um, talk um, also about sports and about chemistry, about science and about how to combine um, what we love with uh, what we can and what our capacities are. So very interesting mix. Let's go on and let's see what our panelists have to say. Um, as usual, if you have any questions during a webinar, you can enter your question into the question pan. So for the organizer, me <laughs> to select and to combine to the panelists. If you want to speak directly, please raise your hand and I will have an opportunity um, to, to connect with you and maybe you can, you know, um, have a comment in uh, indirect and you can address to the panelists yourself. With this said, um, let's know um, and get uh, to know better our panelists. So we have Sally Nomani and Clarissa Rios today, Rojas. Um, Sally will be present, uh, having a presentation on the leveraging your strengths outside the classroom to enhance your academic and professional experience. And um, I will not tell you more, but I just know that it's um, in connection with what we can do outside the academical world, what is our passion and how we can combine the hobby with lessons, with our academical pot potential to succeed. And Clarissa will deliver a presentation on Shall I Venture to Study Abroad Without a Scholarship? I know this was one of the most important questions and most um, addressed questions last uh, uh, webinar we had. And uh, I know a lot of you are eager to participate in a different contest and to find that scholarship, but I think Clarissa had a way to do it without that. So um, uh, let's see what is her advice. 
Uh, without any further ado, let's go to the first presentation. And um, I, will, I would like to tell you a little bit about Sally. Sally is an international fellow at Peace Players International, a sport for social change organization that uses sport to unite, empower, and educate communities in conflict. She is based in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Sport has a language of its own that everyone can understand and appreciate, a language of hope where anything is possible, where we underdog will always have a fair shot to achieve greatness and where leaders are made not born. And in her own words, she says, I began my career in girls empowerment and sports-based youth development, and this was where I discovered my life's mission, to leverage the skills learned from playing sport to empower young people, and in special girls, to unlock and realize their full potential. This mission has uh, served me well as a career compass and a source of fulfillment. It has given me the avenue to combine my love for sports, cultural discovery, and building partnership for social change and brand awareness. I have worked uh, uh, multi-country teams to plan and execute leadership for sports, international exchange in Cyprus, Middle East, Norway, Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I would like to, to say that also I know Sally personal. We did um, a course uh, during our master's studies and it's just she is a very enthusiastic, very positive person. And this is why um, I really wanted her to share this passion um, as, and, and, and with, with you. So Sally, please, um, you have uh, the floor. Wow, thanks so much, Diana, for the lovely introduction, and thanks to you and women for providing such a resourceful platform uh, for the promotion and realization of uh, women's economic empowerment. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks as well to Ekpa Palik, which uh, Clarissa just uh, told me how to pronounce correctly, uh, for you know sharing this initiative to connect students with uh, professionals uh, for the purpose of men mentorship. I am really thrilled and honored uh, to share my story and my presentation with um, our listeners. Uh, my presentation today will be, you know, highlighting the positive impact of sports, um, the lives of um, young people, especially girls, and, you know, how sport can be used as a medium to develop leadership, leadership skills and to build up your confidence to really um, pursue your life goals. Um, I think before we get started, it might help to give, give, the, give our listeners a bit of uh, a background of myself and my academic uh, background. So I, I attended Lehman College, which is a part of the City University of New York network, um, where I earned my, my bachelor's in political science and philosophy. And, you know, at Lehman College, I was a three-year captain of the women's basketball team. And, you know, very similar to, to most liberal arts students, I, I lacked the clarity, you know, on what career path I wanted to pursue after college. And right after undergrad, I started applying to, to graduate schools. And I was accepted into the new school, which is where I met um, Diana, on a partial scholarship. And I went on to earn my master's in international affairs um, at the new school. And it really wasn't until towards the end of my graduate studies that I began to gain a greater like clarity on what career path I wanted to, to embark, embark on. So I, I really hope my experience in the process that I followed as a student while, while in grad school will be useful um, in some way to our listeners today. So if we look at our next slide, um, I remember it was my last, uh, my last year in grad school, I, I sat down uh, and I really wanted to help myself become more, more self-aware. So um, Diana, it's a slide before this one. Diana, do you have the slides? So um, just going back to my, my last semester in grad school, um, I wanted to focus on becoming more, just more self-aware. And I, I spent some time, wrote down my goals, and I wanted to decide, all right, what do I want to achieve, you know, academically, and what do I want to achieve professionally as well? So I identified my different strengths. I identified what I categorized as my barriers to growth. And in my case, you know, it was, you know, public speaking and, you know, a limited working experience. So, you know, at this point, I knew that I wanted to, um, pinpoint a sense of direction for my career, and I was going to leverage my strengths towards, you know, making sense of my, my career path. 
So, you know, I started looking for coaching opportunities and I knew I just didn't want to coach sports. I knew I wanted to make an impact. And this was when I discovered uh, Power Play NYC, which is a nonprofit organization that uses sports to teach life skills and healthy living. And I began working part-time as a coach in elementary schools, you know, while in graduate schools. And I coached in different elementary schools around New York City. And I was so shocked, you know, to find that, that most of the schools did not have um, after-school sports programs for girls. You know, I even remember coaching at a school that didn't have a, a gym or a sports hall, as we call it here in, in Belfast. And, you know, a lot of the girls that I also coached, I noticed, had very limited access to playing sports. You know, either their parents worked late and couldn't pick them up from practice or from after-school programs, or they had younger siblings that they had to take care of. And I also noticed the impact that I was having, you know, just by being myself and being a coach and providing a safe space uh, for these girls to so really develop their self-confidence and, and self-esteem. And during the summer, you know, I felt very engaged. You know, I, was, I had a lot of fun uh, while coaching. And most importantly, I was getting comfortable with, you know, speaking in front of large groups. Uh, luckily, um, 10 and 11-year-olds are an easy, easy group of people to, to communicate with. And after my first year of coaching at Power Play, you know, I became a lead coach. And I took on more operational and program management uh, responsibilities. And as a lead coach at Power Play, I gained exposure to project management and coordination. Um, I met remarkable women who had leveraged the life skills they gained through sports, you know, such as resilience, competition, teamwork, you know, to succeed in their careers in finance, sports management, investment banking, and consulting. Um, I found their story so um, inspirational and motivating. And not only was I gaining strong professional experience and strengthening my barriers, um, to growth, I was reaching a greater sense of clarity as well. And, you know, I really came to appreciate during this time the significance of sports and why more girls should be given the opportunity to take part from a young, young age. And I also, you know, realized something that I never thought of during my playing years, which, which is that, you know, sport is, is one of the most important socio-cultural uh, learning environments in our society. And until quite recently, it had only been reserved for, for boys and men. I think that, you know, combined with other physical um, health benefits uh, from playing sports, you know, it's critical, critically important that we, we widen access um, for, uh, to playing sports for young girls. And you, you can imagine what a, a young girl growing up having a you know, strong sense of self-confidence uh, because of her achievement in sports or because of the friendships that she developed while, while playing on the sports team. You know, that girl is more likely to, to set goals and have a support system to pursue those goals and she's probably more likely to be successful as well. So in the next slide, I talk about, you know, finding your element. Um, I remember, you know, when I, when I started graduate school, you know, I was on this mission to redefine my identity. You know, I had spent my high school, you know, even middle school and college years totally invested in my sport, you know, in, in basketball. And I was, you know, prepared to challenge myself to succeed academically without my athletic identity. And I soon realized that, you know, this was a mistake and that my sport, you know, was indeed my element. And, you know, not to be confused with your passion. We hear a lot about, you know, you know encouraging young people these days to follow their passions. I think your element is a completely different, different um, plan. And uh, it's really where you feel most at ease. Um, it's the culture that you're a part of. It's the peers you're around. It's your social style. You know, it's the type of work that you, you gravitate to. You know, for example, do you do you thrive in a team setting or uh, do you prefer to work you know, in, independently? You know, do you feel more comfortable with writing or do you feel more comfortable with quantitative analysis? You know, for me, you know, helping young people and young girls especially be the, be be the best that they could be was my element and sport was the medium I was going to use to thrive in that element and also to overcome, you know, what I identified as my, my barriers to growth. And once you identify, you know, what your element is, don't be afraid to combine your element with your strengths and your academic and professional interests. So in my, my next slide, I talk a bit more about, you know, once I figured out what my strengths were and I knew what my element is, I had reconnected with my element, um, I was able to really confront my, my barriers to growth. I gained more professional experience. Um, and because I was in my element, I felt very, very comfortable. 
And it was a great space for me to develop and practice what I identified early on as core skills, you know, such as strategic skills, strategic planning skills, analytical skills, presenting skills. And, you know, I think regardless of what field that you choose to go into, what subject you're studying, um, I'm a firm believer that these core skills can position you for opportunities in the future and, of course, to succeed, you know, academically as well. So once you've identified your element and you're aware of what your areas of, you know, what areas you strong, what your strong areas are and where you thrive, um, find as many opportunities as possible within your element to practice and develop you know, these, your core skills. Um, this could be through extracurricular activities. In my case, it was coaching. Um, I knew I was a good writer. You know, I had gained experience in the past by writing for um, the online news platform known as Mike.com during their, during their startup phase. And, you know, I had held leadership develop, uh, sorry, leadership positions in the past as, you know, the captain of my, my basketball team. So once I knew what my different, what I had um, in my skill set or my toolbox, and I had my elements, I was ready to, to move forward. And, you know, I, I'd like to wrap up by, you know, um, really saying a big thank you to Diana and Empower Women for providing this, plat this platform. And I hope my story and my, my experience inspire all of you, you know, to get involved with your local sport community and really to encourage um, girls to take part in sports. Um, when I think about you know, gender inequality, I really believe that sports can play a role in this space. You know, sport is where boys have traditionally um, learned about teamwork and goal setting and the pursuit of excellence and performance and like other you know, achievement-oriented behaviors um, that are necessary for success in the workplace or even in entrepreneurship. Um, in an economic environment where you know, the quality of our children's lives will be dependent on two-income families, um, I think it's really important that, you know, our young girls are not less prepared for, you know, the highly competitive workplace than, you know, than boys. You know, it's no accident that 80% of uh, female executives at Fortune 500 companies are identified with having play, played sports at some point in their lives. Um, I'd also like to stress that, you know, as much as sport it is a great medium to teach life skills and to Im impact the well-being of young people for the better, um, it can only really be successful when complemented with a, a positive youth coaching approach. Um, placing a high focus on creating safe space for young people to freely express themselves, make new for, friends, and learn new skills is, is really key. Um, so that, that's really my, my story and my experience, and I, I hope that um, you know, my experience will, will inspire some of you guys to, to go out and really get involved with, with sport in your local community and really champion uh, using sports to empower empower young people. Thank you so much, Sally. I I think this is a, a wonderful way to to know our person. You, you spoke about the elements. You spoke about how you discovered yourself. You spoke about how you um, stopped at one point in your life and you did some analysis. And um, earlier or later, we all do this exercise. Um, maybe uh, when we will be at the uh, part of a question and answers, you will be also able to tell us what did you take to, to have this that moment of your life, you know, to to uh, rediscover yourself or to combine this and uh, uh, what do you think um, is it like unit laterally appearing uh, in any cases during the university or during the master degree program where it's it's definitely depending on the personality and the, the path they, they, uh, that they have. Um, it's, I think it's an interesting question to have for all of us. So if you have some insights uh, as you finish the presentation at this point, um, <laughs> it will be very interesting to know. Yeah, of course. Diana, do you want me to answer now or later on in the Q&A? Yeah, if you can. I'll go ahead and answer now. Um, so it was really in, in grad school, there were always a lot of our classes uh, had the final projects would always be presentations. So in undergrad, I was kind of found a way to avoid having to, <laughs> um, you know, work on projects that require me to stand in front of large groups. Um, and my sports team, you know, I, I really, my approach was 
to lead by example, but I was also vocal as well. And that was because I felt very comfortable in that environment. Um, in, in the classroom, I did really well when it came to writing and, you know, analyzing different uh, papers. But when it came to having to speak, I was always, you know, I was held back. And I, I remember in grad school, I always, most of my classes required me to speak in front of a large group. Even the, the practicum that Diana and I worked on, we had to present it to the faculty and the rest of our, you know, our fellow students. And I, I realized at that point that for me to really, you know, achieve and to really um, reach my maximum potential, that I really had to confront this fear. And I, I knew I was a good speaker. I knew I, I'm intelligent and I'm a smart woman, but I, I just, you know, I would always freeze up when I had to speak. And it, I remember it was one presentation in particular that I did in grad school where I was like, no, it wasn't a presentation, it was an interview. We, I was interviewing for, um, I wanted to go abroad as part of an international field program. And I sent in my application and I was called in for an interview. And I flopped that interview so bad. <laughs> I remember just freezing up and forgetting everything I wanted to say. And that, that, at that point, that was when I decided that I had to do something about, you know, my fear of, you know, speaking in large groups or speaking in front of a group of people. And that's when I went back and really started to, you know, identify moments in my life where I felt very confident speaking. And I realized that it was usually when I was coaching. So that was why I returned to that element. And in that space, I met some remarkable, I mean, exceptional women that really helped me build up my self-confidence and made me feel more comfortable with, you know, taking on a leadership role and not being, front, not being afraid of, you know, speaking in front of a large group. Thank you, Sally. And I think, you know, we all have that mediums and uh, what are our elements? Maybe it's a question to, to leave at the end of the presentation uh, for all of us to take one minute, maybe now or maybe later, to think upon and to rediscover ourselves or just to um, uh, to analyze what are these elements so we can um, ha only gain advantages from those. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, I think that, you know, the core mission of your work aligns a lot with what we do here at you and Women Empower Women and specifically because we believe that sharing stories um, of success but also challenges and also to promote the collaboration, learning and innovation is key for the development of each of us and also for creating that roadmap that will redefine us and will give us opportunities career-wise and personal-wise. Thank you. And let's go now to our second presentation. Shall I venture to study abroad without a scholarship? I don't know about that, but Clarissa definitely knows. Um, so she's a scientist. She has a bachelor in biology with major in genetics and biotechnology and she is a PhD and she also has a master in biomedicine with major in neuroscience. So how she combined all these elements with um, her love and passion for empowerment, um, she will tell herself, but this helped her to found and direct the ECPAPALEC, an organization focusing on empowering Latin American students by offering both program of professional mentorship and program of women empowerment and she's also ambassador of sustainable development goals in Peru and of course our alumni and uh, champions for change without any further ado I would like to give the floor to Clarissa hello everyone welcome uh, I'm very happy to share this story because uh, I have written an article in Spanish about this and if we go to the next slide, I can start uh, telling you what was my life in 2008. Can I see the next slide? Yeah, perfect. So um, in 2008, I was living in Finland. And my dream was to do this master at the Karolinska Institute University, which was the university who uh, gives or selects who's going to be the Nobel in medicine and physiology every, every year. Um, Sweden is a very equal society in many different ways, in gender, in social status, and help for every one of the citizens and people that is living and studying there. 
and in that in that time also Sweden was giving free education so it was the university of my dreams I applied and I got a position there so as you can see in that picture I was super happy I was in the clouds and then some minutes later bam I have to think how am I gonna study my master of two years without any scholarship without knowing anybody and going by myself and thinking oh my god I have to find a job but I don't speak the language I didn't speak Swedish so I have to think what I have to do and I just want to uh, to remind you that um, when you apply for masters or PhDs don't apply just to the university of your dreams as Diana said you have to have your plan A, B, C and D so of course I applied to many different master programs and I was um, very happy to, to gain the one I really wanted. If we go to the second slide, please. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, I was in Finland. In that time, I was working as a research assistant at BioCity Turku, which, which was a biotechnology um, institution. And I was um, earning 1,000 euros, which was not enough for uh, saving money to, to live in Finland and save money to live in Sweden. That was simply impossible. So uh, how do I got this scholarship? Because uh, I went to Finland as an exchange student. And then as soon as I arrived, I looked for an opportunity for an internship. So I worked for free for one year in this institute. And then when my scholarship to study in Finland finished, I talked to my boss and said, look, my scholarship has finished, but you know how my work is. I'm very passionate about science. Would you like to give me scholarship to stay? So he said, of course, I know your work. Please stay with us. And that's how I, I had this scholarship to live in Finland for one more year. So with that in mind, I just want to remind you that you don't only have to seize for opportunities. I mean, you don't have to only seize them, but you have to dare to ask for these opportunities. If I would have never asked my boss if I could stay because I was embarrassed or because I could think that whatever, I would have never stayed in Finland for one more year and maybe I wouldn't have had the chance to uh, work a little bit extra to gain some money to go to Sweden. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what I decided to do is um, uh, when I received the news that I will study in Sweden, it was May. So I, I thought I need to find another job. And so I start talking with everyone, all my friends, and say, hey, I need a job. I know I don't speak Finnish, so I cannot work as a bartender or I cannot work, um, you know, with customer service. So what do I do? And that's how I found a friend that told me, hey, you know, there is this um, ship, that is the Viking line that is on the, on the picture that goes from Sweden to Finland every day. It goes and comes back. You don't need to speak Finnish and you have to go there and you will work as a cleaner. So you can choose how many hours do you want to work, and it starts at 6 a.m. and then uh, finish at 8, and then it starts again at 6 p.m. and it finish at 8 p.m. So I thought that's perfect. That's um, it, I can do it in, uh, at the same time with my work at the Biotechnology Institute because it was not overlapping. So I got this job, I start working, I calculate how much money I needed for having three months in Sweden where I could find another job in Sweden and that's how I um, was working for the whole June, July and August. And with that I want to say that many people say that you have to have luck in life but what I think that you should say is that you have to work to really find your luck and in this way talking with everyone about what you want to do will always give you ideas about which kind of opportunities you can uh, search or with which people you have to talk to and these things will help you to give the next step. Next slide please. So I worked really really hard during these three months and as I planned I had um, enough money to live without working for three months in Sweden. Anyway as soon as I arrived I I started looking for a job but in this case I didn't know anybody and I didn't have friends yet and I didn't spoke this new language which was Swedish so I started freaking out a little bit but I had the confidence that if I could do it if I could set my mind that I could do it I will just do it 
So the first thing that I can say is that no matter where you go, the problems are not new. So I arrived in 2008, but I'm sure that many people was arriving in the same situation as me before I arrived. So what I did was to go to Google and start writing questions. One of those questions was, how do I find a job in Stockholm, which was the, uh, the place where I was uh, living in that moment. And then that's how I found um, a local uh, website that was for expats. <clears throat> so it was in English. It was not in Swedish. All the content was in English. And in this um, website, you could advertise your skills. For example, if you knew how to, how to play guitar, you can give guitar lessons. If you know how to speak French, you could give uh, French lessons. And also there, was, there were people that were advertising uh, people to work with them. So, for example, they were looking for um, people to work in a restaurant, packing up fruits, etc. So I put my advertisement there, and I start. Uh, I I remember I started saying that I speak Spanish and I could teach, and that's how I found many different jobs that I will show you in the next slide. So during that time, I worked uh, at the beginning as a cleaner, which was the easier for me to, to find. Uh, after that, I was also a Spanish teacher, but then <laughs> my first um, student was from, uh, well, it doesn't matter where he, he was from, but I remember that he came with his wedding ring. On the second lesson, he came without any ring. And on the third lesson, he invited me to go out. So of course, I have to finish that uh, lesson. And then I was, again, without any job. So then I found a job working in a bar, and because I didn't speak Swedish, so the only job I could do was picking up the glasses that people leave at the, at the bar. So I was doing that, and I worked there for a little bit. And also, this is a tip for, <laughs> for all the students that are working and studying abroad. Uh, look at your university, because there are many volunteer opportunities. For example, in Karolinska Institute, which is a a medical university there were a lot of PhD students looking for volunteers and they will pay with coupons or they will pay with money like 50, 50 euro cash and things like this so I was part of many different experiments and it was um, it was a great experience I met many people and so on but the work that gave me the the best flexibility and the best amount of money that helped me to support myself during these two years was working as a nanny which was also uh, a really rewarding experience. And I met these fantastic families which, uh, with whom I'm still friends. And hey, after two years working like this, I got my master in biomedicine with major in neuroscience. So there was uh, a great accomplishment that helped me to uh, work in Germany for one year in a pharmaceutical company. Then I went to Australia to do my PhD for four years. I had the awesome opportunity to uh, meet empower women uh, online as well, like in the same way as how do I empower women? And then I found Empower Women organization and I met Diana and I met all the different um, alumni and now the new champions. And that encouraged me to work on women empowerment. And that's how one thing led to the other one. And it keeps leading to different things. And I want to say that um, I was not the best of my class, but I can say that I was probably the most persistent and the most resilient. And I think those things are very key for anybody that wants to do something as challenging and, as I said on the title, to venture yourself to do these kind of things. And I would like to uh, finish with um, another article that I wrote in Spanish, which is about the um, myths or the things that, that they don't let you go abroad or to, uh, to venture to do your studies abroad. One of them is the one that I talked today, which is about <clears throat> not having a scholarship because you wonder how am I going to support myself economically? I don't have any money. But as I mentioned, there, there are some ways. My way is one of them. But if you go and talk with more people, I'm sure that you will find other ways and how you can do it. Uh, other, other thing is that when you say, like, I don't speak English, well, when I arrived to Finland, I spoke like Tarzan. And me want this. My boss still remembers that. And he always tells me and we laugh together. I have a friend from Spain. She arrived knowing nothing of English. And after one year of exchange studies, she was speaking uh, basic English and a little bit better than that. So don't limit yourself because you don't speak English. Just go there. The best way to learn it is the need 
that you will feel that you have to communicate. I remember that, well, I say a lot of jokes, and when I just arrived to Finland, I wanted to say a joke, but then when I was thinking of how to translate it, everyone was in another topic. So that's a one funny thing. And But, you know, with practice, with watching videos, with talking with people, listening to the courses, you will just get there. Do not worry about that. Other thing that um, was also brought up at the first webinar is the, is the sentence, like, I'm in a relationship, and I'm afraid that if I go abroad, we will break up. I would say my personal um, experience is that I had a boyfriend as well, and we broke up when I went to Finland. And I honestly do not regret, because um, I found my path, my path. I'm very happy that I took this opportunity to go to Finland and expand, expand my horizons. And I think that it was the same for him. He has now a, a lovely family and a lovely wife, and I think it worked very well for both. Also, it could be the opposite, that you uh, are with a partner, and then your partner joins you after one year. This has been the case for some friends of mine, that um, it has worked very well. They were uh, separate for one year, but then the partner went there, and then they studied together, and they kept having their relationship. There are always... Um, opportunities and there are always as i mentioned before where there is a will there is a way you will find the manner how to the way how to do it and finally as i always say to the um, girls that we talk sometimes here in peru boyfriends may or may not leave you but your academic degrees will stay with you forever so keep just that in mind and i'm happy to receive all your questions and I finish saying that all your efforts will be always worth it and believe always in yourself and the potential that you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clarissa. This was a very <laughs> sincere and very frank presentation and thank you for being so honest. And you know, this was a Pur purpose of all this um, webinar series that we created together, the Roadmap to Success, is to be as frank as possible with ourselves and with our stakeholders, empower women, um, members and friends, because we always meet, um, you know, lovely friends or, um, uh, I don't know, colleagues at work or um, um, some way um, in, in a special events and then we always ask how how did you succeed to do that what was your path to success can you can you explain can you advise something and, and often we we get the answer like oh this was so easy oh you know oh, just simply go apply and that's it but nothing is just simple and nothing is just just it was easy Every action in our life has some background stories and this is why we decided to create this platform of six webinars and to share them for those of us who need some inspiration but also who need to be in a special group of trusting uh, people and who can just um, see that it's not ourselves that go through this road of hardship and uh, uh, discovering our identity, but uh, peers do the same. Um, both Clarissa and Sally mentioned education and training for girls and young women uh, as uh, um, one of the most important elements improve the employment opportunities and carry impact across generations, creating skilled, confident and empowered women now and in the future. And uh, both of you uh, spoke about the role models and um, Clarissa, uh, Sally, I would like to, um, to ask you uh, why why, why did you believe in role models and why do you think that sharing your story, um, Father, it's important, uh, but in this way, being frank, why don't you cover something and, you know, because now there is uh, new technologies, there is new new approaches to to um, doing things but still we go back to that traditional that yes if we can innovate something and enhance something we can do this but as you said Clarissa these questions are not new the approach of tackling them is different so if how important in your life is role model but also how important is for you to give back uh, so, if you don't mind, Sally, maybe I can start. 
that's exactly the idea uh, when we created Ekpapalek. We want to have these mentors, which are role models for all the ones that are just starting their professional pathway. And also with the Ekpapalek women, we also have these women role models for these young ladies to, to look uh, on them and see how they can do to progress themselves, not just academically, but also personally. I think it's very important because, for example, in my case, I had to start from zero to 50. But if you share these stories, you allow another person to start not from zero, but to start from 15. And they don't have to go all these problems or all these uh, pathway again that you have already walked. You really want to help back to your community by teaching them or giving them the inspiration or the inside knowledge that you can get from your local experience, from your international experience, or also from the experiences that you hear from your colleagues. So I'm always trying to tell this to everyone that I talk to, mainly because I just want to give them ideas, the ideas how to do it, how to do it, and the courage and the self-confidence that if they could do it, why wouldn't you be able to do it? And uh, I, I leave it to Sally because I'm, I'm sure that she has also some nice experiences from her work with the sports and girls. Um, yes, uh, I think for me personally, um, growing up as a young girl, I didn't I didn't have many role models. I don't think I really had a positive role model that I looked up to, and I figured out a lot of things on my own as I as I got older. And it wasn't until I I really started coaching and really exposed myself to women who were, you know, really successful in their careers. And when I started talking to them, I realized that most of them had faced the similar challenges that I was facing at the time, you know, just starting off in my career. And they they pretty much shared their stories and they were very authentic. And and I felt like I wasn't alone, that a lot of the things, the challenges that I, I had faced and a lot of things that I went through, um, that there were other people who've been through that those stages before. And that really helped me feel more confident. It made me feel like, it was just, just me who was just, you know, who was struggling and just just lacked confidence. So there are other people who have been through the same situation and they're willing to pay it forward. And I, I felt like it was my responsibility to continue to pay, pay it forward. And, you know, Clarissa, you made a point in your presentation where you talked about that you weren't the best student, but you were the most persistent and the most resilient. I think that is, that's really, really key for a lot of um, young people, a lot of us who are just starting off in our careers, that it's really important to be as persistent and really to flex, to build up that muscle of resilience because you're going to face a lot of challenges. You're going to face a lot of setbacks. You're going to have a lot of things happen where you're, you're, going to be, you're, you're going to find yourself stuck. And the more you, the earlier you start to build up that resilience um, muscle, the, the, the more easier it will be for you in the long run. And um, there are lots of really great, um, well, um, lots of really successful women who've done a lot in their careers and they're paying it forward and the mentorship that I, I received you know um, just graduating from graduate school I, I always felt that it was important that I, I give it back I see a lot of young girls who look like me and I can imagine what they're going through because I know what I went through when I was their age and I, I feel a sense of responsibility to to give back and to support them as best as I could Thank you so much, Sally and Clarissa. So your stories show when women and girls are given opportunities to study and learn, they gain confidence and improve their chances of finding paid employment and increasing their wages. Um, Clarissa, in your presentation, you went uh, and basically told us what type of jobs um, you, you, you did to support yourself. Um, uh, both of you, in, uh, in a different way, you told us that you you also encountered challenges in connection with human rights, security, um, and, and harassment. And how important is for uh, young women, women and girls in general, uh, but for, for that matter, for boys and young men who entering into the path to know their rights. And I know from personal experience and also based on the presentation today, but it doesn't come in one moment. It takes, you know, experience, experience to understand, but also it takes informative decisions to go to open uh, that link into internet and to Google it or, you know, to open that book and mm -hmm. to read from that. So what advice would, would, would you um, give um, our audience today, our friends? How, how, how 
I mean, how they should be careful of passing through all this journey. And um, before I um, will give you the opportunity to respond, I just wanted to share the feedback from our um, um, members. Betty say, wonderful presentation, Clarissa. Boseda says, Frank present. Uh, 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 great presentation and frank presentation from Sally and Clarissa, thank you. Then we have a compliment from Sally, from Betty as well. Very inspiring story, Sally. And then we have a question from um, Laura, but why don't we take it after we, we tackle the, the, the question with uh, human rights and um, uh, also the importance of being informed and uh, critically analyze positive and negative parts of every decision? Um, I, I can answer first um, since we're, <laughs> we're being very honest today. So, um, so I moved to the United States when I was 12. Um, my family and I were originally from Nigeria and for the next about eight to ten years in America I was undocumented so I went to undergrad and grad school and during those during my school years I was an undocumented student so that meant I had no access to financial aid and I also couldn't work so you can imagine for me while in school um, I didn't I always felt like there was nothing above I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel because after I finish school, what am I going to do next? Um, so there, during that time, I, I, I made an effort to really expose myself to as many experiences as possible. So I read a lot, and I found as many volunteer opportunities, as many internship opportunities that allowed me to work, even though I couldn't work in the United States at a time. So once I, you know, my, my immigration status changed, which just was the end of my graduate education, um, I all of a sudden felt very empowered. Um, I felt like I was ready to really take on the world and really to pursue as many, all the opportunities that I couldn't pursue when I was in undergrad or when I was in, in graduate school. So that challenge or that um, barrier that I faced during my high school years and my college and you know, some of my grad school years really, I think, prepared me for the challenge that I continue to face now as a professional uh, because I really felt there were moments in, while I was in school that I felt that I felt like, why am I even still pursuing my education? Where because I didn't, I wasn't sure what my next steps were going to be. If I'd even be able to work in the United States, um, if I'd be able to pursue a career. So that that barrier, that challenge, really um, helped me build up my my muscle or that resilience uh, muscle, and really prepared me for the challenges that I continue to face uh, today as a professional. Uh, in my case, I can say that uh, maybe I could start with some recommendations. I would say travel as much as you can because you will open your mind and understand many things, not just abroad, but also things from your old country. This is going to sound super silly, but um, until I went to Finland, I never questioned why, and sorry that I say this word, but why my bump my butt was touched so many times in Peru. Mm -hmm. It was that you go, you walk around and then someone just comes and phew, touches it and runs, no? So I got, I got angry about it, but I also got um, used to it in the same way that I got used to, to the honking of the cars. It is annoying, but it's hap it happens and I have to live with it. It wasn't until I went abroad that I really questioned and I said like, why I never did anything? Why I never, uh, wrote a letter to the mayor while I never, um, in those in those times the, uh, there was no Facebook but there was Hi-Fi, why I never I wrote an status complaining about it, why I never made a meeting with uh, with someone or to talk about it and say like what can we do about this, you know, it's, it's not normal, it's not fair, it limits ourselves in Peru, blah blah blah. So I was 21, 22, that's, I think that's a very uh, <laughs> uh, you're very old if you have these thoughts, just uh, you start having these thoughts just then. So I would say that do that, in my case was by traveling, but if you cannot travel, read. Now with technology, you can connect with people from so many different countries, talk, talk with them, ask how's the situation in, in, in their countries. Also going to Finland, Sweden, I could meet many people from Asia, from the Middle East, from Africa, so I could learn what was happening or what was the condition of women there. 
and I think that also triggered my my passion and my need to feel the responsibility to do something. So I'm very pleased that I took I embarked on this journey because also for the reasons that I just mentioned. And having another example, uh, when I see in retrospective what I would have done, when I was in Sweden, which is like such an equal country in terms of gender, let's say, I went to an internship interview and my, and my boss, because he became my boss during the interview, asked me, are you planning to have children? And this is a question that is not, it's, it's supposed not to be allowed when you're having an internship for a work or a, an interview for a work or an internship or whatever. They cannot ask you or they cannot hire you depending on your answer of yes, I will have kids or not. So in my case, at that time, I was single and I didn't want to have kids. So I said like, no, and I just passed around. I never went to the uh, board of the institute and say like, this shouldn't happen and things like that. So I think that for all the young girls and boys that are following our webinar today, I would just suggest to um, learn about your rights since, uh, as early as possible so you can have an answer and a comeback and you can also denounce, you can go to, to the authorities and say like this is happening in my university and it shouldn't be like this. So, um, thank you, Claudia. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, I finished there. <laughs> so, uh, because we have several other questions and I would like to take as much as possible, so if for the next question we can be maybe a little bit shorter, um, so we can give more answers. So, um, uh, Thanks for the interesting presentation. I agree with you, the sports can help acquire great skills and self-confidence through discipline, regular e exercise, uh, persistent attitude, and so on. Do you think that the positive and honest competition in sports could be transferred to other industries? In other words, would sport coaches be able to train business managers on life skills? Um, Sally, if you can take this question now. Wow, that is a great question. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, I definitely think that those, those life skills are transferable. Um, a lot of female athletes or athletes in general um, have a strong sense of self-confidence and a sense of belonging. You, you have an idea of who you are and what you can contrib contribute to a team. So having, being, having that mindset, you can take that mindset to, your, your, um, to the classroom, to your professional life as well. So there are actually a few um, coaches who, you know, who work in consultant, where they work with um, private companies and you know pro provide different workshops on how to leverage leadership skills developed as you know, as an athlete and how you can apply that to your um, to your business and to your uh, professional life and how to build relationships with people within your your business. Um, it, part of my long term goals is uh, to hopefully someday I'll uh, start a consultant firm where I help um, young female athletes from lower income schools or lower income univers universities to you know, pinpoint, pinpoint what their skill set sets are and how they can leverage those skill, skill sets to transition to a career beyond their sport. So there's definitely, a, there's definitely a link between the business world and the sports world and there are lots of ways that we can you know, bring those, those two um, entities together and to learn from both, both fields. Thank you, Sally. Uh, this uh, was a question from Laura. Thank you, Laura, as well, for a great question and actually for challenging, you know, us into a different direction um, as well to rethink and to reapply the same concepts into a little bit of different segment uh, uh, of the uh, market. Um, a, a comment rather from Yeni. Good morning. We really thank you from Venezuela for this webinar. We need to bring young women skills for the empowerment. Um, <laughs> thank you, Yeni, for, for appreciation. Uh, and um, uh, a question, I think, mostly f because uh, Clarissa mentioned in her presentation about the issue of sexual harassment, maybe we'll not go uh, very deep into stereotypes and, and this topic, uh, ending violence against women, because it's a separate topic, but uh, Maybe we can take, uh, take it, um, a question from Betty. As we interact with young girls out there, one of the questions they ask is how can they make men believe that they have all what it takes to even be trusted with leadership position without seeing them as just, quote mark, women? Clarissa? 
Uh, I think that uh, it can start at different levels. For example, um, at my institute, I went to the um, to the director and I proposed um, that we, for example, could have more webinar, not webinar, seminars where um, women in high positions could come and talk about their experiences, exactly what we are doing here. So I think that's one way that you could do in your organization, institution, university, wherever you are. Just go to the person in charge and propose your idea. It's very easy. You just have to gather some women that come for three weeks, one each week, and then you gather with the old rest of men and women because uh, men have also have to be invited, and then uh, expose them to the things that they don't know. Many of them have no idea of the challenges we have to face, but if you put them in the same room and you talk openly about it, I think that could be a good option. Thank you, Clarissa. And uh, just because we are in the last minutes of our webinar, um, I could not uh, mention that today international community celebrates the World Intellectual Property Day, and the topic for this year is innovation improving lives. Um, this year we, we all explore how innovation is making our lives healthier, safer, and more comfortable, turning problems into progress. Uh, we all look at how the intellectual property system supports innovation by attracting investment, rewarding creators, encouraging them to develop their ideas, and ensuring that their new knowledge is freely available. Of course, it gets into some controversial uh, points uh, um, sometimes, and we will not get into that now. But the final question to both of you is thinking about um, your your road and thinking about your future plans and, and current status and thinking about all these wonderful women around you and men in general, thinking about the, the crowds, uh, the friends that you have, the organization that you work with, how it's important is to be innovative and how important is to have this edge for skills development. I would really love to hear your opinion on that. Um, yeah, I, I can take that. Um, well, Clarissa, so you can go ahead first. That's fine. Oh, no, that's fine. Just go ahead. I just mute myself, and then I continue. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, Diana, your question about was about uh, how important is it to be innovative? Um, so if we think about what the job market or what even the workplace is like uh, these days, it's constantly changing, it's constantly evolving. I think it's really critical that, you know, we're always on our toes and we're looking for ways to uh, make things better, to improve, you know, our, our approach and our sense of leadership as well. Um, innovation is something that's going to be a part of um, the workplace for a long time. If we even look at social media, for example, and the impact that it's had, on how you know businesses um, tell their stories, how nonprofit organizations uh, tell their stories as well. So it's really important that we we stay on our toes and we're looking for ways to connect with as many people as possible, and to really you know continue to make things uh, better and also to improve not only improve ourselves but also improve the organizations and the lives of the people that we're we're working with. Uh, there are some things that are not being taught at schools and university, which are uh, which are soft skills that I think you really need to enter the workforce and to stand out. So I would just suggest and recommend to everyone to use technology to do it. You can follow courses from MIT, from Cambridge, from the best universities in the world, from your house, from your bedroom, from your room. Uh, and they are for free. Go to EDX, for example, for these free available courses. Learn about what's up to date in your field of study. Follow webinars, webinars that can give you these uh, soft skills that you need on how to look for information online, how to expand your network, how important it is that you build your connections because these connections can lead you to your future work and things like this. So I think that we all should work on ourselves in these kind of things using technology. 
Thank you so much, Sally, and thank you so much, Clarissa. I'm just at the final note from myself, I would like to say that women around the globe are supporting each other on the road to economic empowerment and with strong women providing influence and inspiration for future generation. I think that we all become our everyday heroes and we all can pave the way to a better tomorrow for women and girls and this is what we believe here and this is what every day of our work uh, it, it, it has a meaning and a goal to do so. So we hope that this um, one hour webinar helped some of us to, to believe in ourselves and to pose all of these questions to rediscover or just to uh, gain more confidence. We appreciate your time and frank discussion and thank you for great pan uh, presentations. I will just want to remind our uh, friends and uh, and everyone who tune in today that our next webinar will be uh, on 3rd of May. It's a webinar in Spanish and it's on creating your own opportunities, how to study a career you don't have in your country. If you are an English speaking, um, uh, you, you can tune in on 10th of May and we will talk about entrepreneurship as a way to finance your studies. And and also, hopefully, we will have Jose with his presentation next time. I hope he will get better and uh, he will be able to join us. I also want to remind our community that tomorrow is international. We celebrate the International Girls in ICT Day, and we we normally do not have two webinars in a row in the same week. But today um, and tomorrow is a special uh, days. Uh, we do have two important celebrations that we wanted to talk about and we wanted to raise these questions because we think this is important for our work but also for the future of economic empowerment sector and for each of us as uh, through our personal development, skills development and lifelong learning. So tomorrow we have a special webinar um, to celebrate the International Girls in ICT Day and also to talk about science, technology, innovation and what uh, is the importance for girls and what is the status of these jobs on the current market. So please join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, New York time. I would like to thank one more time our panelists Sally and Clarissa. We appreciate your time. I would like to thank all our friends and uh, uh, Empower Women community who joined today or who will join this webinar uh, via YouTube recording that we will provide later on today. Please follow up us on empowerment.org and ekpapalek.com, um, Twitter, social media, Facebook. We are always happy to take your question after the webinars as well. Thank you. Have a good day or good evening, everyone.